Good morning, everyone. This is Pastor Tommy McMurtry back again from the Liberty Baptist Church in Rock Falls. This is the Spirit of Liberty broadcast. We come every Sunday morning from 9.15 to 9.45, try to be a blessing to you and try to help you learn something from the Word of God. We hope you listen every week. If you ever miss a broadcast, you can check us out at youtube.com slash give me liberty baptist and we have a playlist of all the radio programs where you can listen and you can watch we often have special guests on here where we discuss different topics from the bible and i would love to hear some suggestions from the crowd on topics that you would like covered so if you want to send us an email at lbc of rock falls at gmail.com and just uh, send us a request, a subject that you'd like us to talk about. That's lbcofrockfalls at gmail.com. And we just hope to be a blessing. And we, do, we believe the Word of God is the final authority. We believe in the King James Version of the Bible. We talked about that the last two weeks. And if you ever like to come and visit our church, we would love to have you. Check out our website, givemelibertybaptist.com. We would love to have you come visit any of our services so make sure you do, make sure you check us out. And uh, we also live stream all of our services and have all the preaching on there if you'd like to hear more. So this morning, what I would like to talk about uh, is the subject of grace and specifically what it means to be under grace. Now, a lot of times when people talk about being under grace, they don't always mean the same thing. And the meaning often isn't what the Bible teaches. But let me read a verse to you that I think is often misused. In Romans chapter 6, verse 14, it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. Now, right there, that is an exciting verse that, I mean, ought to thrill our hearts when we hear it, that we are not under the law, but under grace. You know, the law of the Lord, it is. It's good. It's great. It's wonderful. But you know what? I'm not so great. I'm not so wonderful. I've got some problems. In fact, I am a transgressor of the law. I am a sinner. And so I need a savior. And if I'm going to have a savior, that savior is going to have to show me mercy. He's going to have to give me grace if I'm going to have any hope of obtaining that salvation. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ does for us. We see at the end of this chapter is the famous verse where it says, for the wages of sin is death. That's what I've earned because I'm a transgressor of God's law. But thankfully, the gift of God, which is opposite of a wage, it's something that's free. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So thankfully, there was a time in my life where I realized that I was a sinner and a transgressor of the law. And I did what Romans 10, 13 says. I called on the Lord for salvation, asking him for forgiveness, accepting his payment for my sins instead of my own payment, instead of my own good works. I accepted the work of Jesus Christ. And so now I am no longer under the law, but I am under grace. But ladies and gentlemen, if you have never called on the Lord for salvation, if you have never believed on him and trusted in his death, burial, and resurrection, accepted that as payment for your sins, if you're someone who thinks that the way to heaven is by being good, then you need to understand that you are under the law. The Bible, or many people, often teach that being under grace, it's like a new thing, like we are in this dispensation of grace. Therefore, everybody's basically under grace. But no, that is not the case. I'm going to show you that if you're not saved and you're not under grace, you're under the law. Because when you stand before God someday, the Bible is very clear that we are going to be, you're going to be judged according to your works. And you're going to be judged according to the word of God. And if your works don't match up with what the word of God has commanded, then you will go to hell. And everyone who is judged by their works, it's they're going to go to hell because we've all sinned and we all come short of the glory of God. If you're going to get under grace, okay, it's not about the dispensation that you live in, all right? It's about whether or not you have accepted Christ's payment for your sins. If that's you, then you are under grace. So let me prove this to you 
because uh, you know we don't believe in dispensationalism at Liberty Baptist Church. I believe it's a false doctrine. And if you have any questions about that or any problems with that, I can prove that to you many different ways. I've got a whole playlist of videos on our YouTube channel debunking dispensationalism. But I could help you more on that if you needed it. But another false teaching that's out there, and this one's probably much more common in the Sterling and Rock Falls area. I don't know of any hardcore dispensationalists in our area, but I do know there's a lot of what we call trendies or liberals that will take that passage that says we are not under the law but under grace, and they use that as an excuse to throw out the law, which is also not what we are supposed to do. They never want to preach hard against sin. You know, they're never going to get up from the pulpit and, you know, step on anyone's toes. They just preach all just light, fluffy, cotton candy type sermons because they think, well, we're not under the law, but under grace. You know, you stay out of Leviticus, and especially Leviticus chapter 20. You know, you stay out of those Old Testament books and let's just talk about the love of Jesus. But folks, you got to understand, there's some things that pe these people are greatly misunderstanding that we need to get to the bottom of. So let's look at some context of this verse when it said, but ye are not under the law, but under grace. Let's see if he's talking to everybody there or if he's just talking to certain people. So in order to kind of get the context of this, it's important that we go back to chapter 5 and we see where chapter 5 ended, what it was talking about. And it says in Romans 5.19, For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, what does this mean when it says the law entered that the offense might abound? What this is saying here is when God gave us this law, all of a sudden it made us even more guilty. That it just every one of those laws that were added it made us even more of a transgressor. And you say, so why would he do that? Why can't we just have less rules? Why can't we just have less laws? How is this a good thing that all these laws were added? Well, I'll tell you why it was a good thing. Because of the fact that one sin is enough to make you come short of the glory of God. And you know, there's many people today who do not see themselves as sinners deserving of hell. And often people say, well, I've never killed anybody. Well, you all realize that's thou shalt not kill is not the only commandment in the Bible. There's a whole bunch of commandments. And if there was only the, just the one, well, then, you know, people might not see themselves as being sinful because we see that the standard to, for getting into heaven, it's perfection. Jesus Christ is that standard and none of us can measure up to that. So God gave us all these laws. Why? To show us just how sinful we are. It makes us, it's going to make us realize we're a sinner even more if we've broken a hundred laws instead of just one law. But understand, even if you've broken one law, you deserve to go to hell. But if we've broken a hundred laws, then you say, how can that be better? I'll tell you why that's better. Because in order for someone to get saved, they must realize that they are a sinner and in need of a Savior. And that person who's only got one sin, they aren't going to really see themselves as in needing as needing a Savior. But that person that has a hundred sins, they'll get it. They'll understand it. So God gave all these laws as a way to show us just how sinful we are. This was for our benefit. This was a good thing. You say, well, it made us more of a lawbreaker. Well, the thing is, the penalty for breaking 100 laws is the same as breaking one law, and that's death. And the way out of that penalty of sin, it's not by breaking less laws. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It's by realizing that he's your Savior. So this actually was a good thing for us. This was beneficial if there had only been one law, We'd have still broken it too, and yet, but it would have been harder for us to see ourselves as needing a Savior. 
So understand, when you're reading that Old Testament, you're looking like, why all these laws? Because you needed to see yourself as a sinner. And you know what? Anybody who doesn't think that they deserve to go to hell is someone who has not studied the Bible. They are someone who has not studied the law of God. They've not read the law of God because if they read the law of God, they would realize they need a Savior and they need one bad. So now let's get into chapter 6. Look what it says in verse 1. What should we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Because remember what he said, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. So you see, when Jesus or when God added all these laws, it made me abound even more in sin. But the thing is, I can still go to heaven because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. God's grace can cover that. Yes, it made me more of a lawbreaker, but his grace is still able to overcome that and I can still be saved. But as a believer now, that I understand this, should I take advantage of that? Absolutely not. I shouldn't take advantage of it. That would be wicked for me to take advantage of God's grace and say, well, you know what? I'm just going to go keep on sinning because where sin abounds, grace is much more abound. That is a wicked attitude. God is not going to bless that. And so it says, you know, it says, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus into Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. One of these days we are going to be like Christ. So you know what? We should try to be like him today. We should try to follow the word of God. We should try to be like him. Now, what does that look like? What does it look like to be like Christ? What does it take to be like him? What pleases him? How can I know what pleases him? I'll tell you exactly how you can know, and it's from the law of God. It's from the Old Testament. And this is why preachers need to be preaching about the law. Preachers and pastors, they're supposed to be teaching people in the congregation how to live. They're supposed to be teaching them how to please God and how to be a good example. They are supposed to do that. They are supposed to preach the Old Testament. Okay, now understand, and I'll probably do a whole lesson just on this, you know, people are like, well, what about sacrificing animals? And what about, you know, this? What about the Sabbath? There are many things that Jesus Christ finished. When he died on the cross and when he rose again, Jesus Christ finished the sacrifices. Jesus Christ fulfilled those feasts. And many of those, uh, you know, the dietary restrictions, all of those things, Jesus Christ finished those things. He did not do away with those things. He did not just cast them out. No, he finished them. And now we are on to something else. But understand, he did not finish the morality. The moral law should still be in place today. We should still have laws against murder. We should still have laws against adultery and fornication and stealing we should have laws against all of those things. And you know what? Thankfully, we still do many of those things. Not all the things I mentioned. Thankfully, we still have laws against kidnapping. And you know what? The Bible has laws against kidnapping. Those are good things. God never did away with the moral law. But those ceremonial things, Jesus Christ, he did not throw them out. He finished them. And I'm thankful for that. We'll probably do a whole... A lesson just on that sometime explaining why that is but anyway we want to st we should want to study the word of God so we can know how to be like Christ so we can know how to please him in verse 6 it says knowing this that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin for he that is dead is freed from sin now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, 
knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him, for in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. So right here in this passage, it's showing what our mindset should be and how we should live our lives. Since Christ was victorious, we can be victorious. You know, we now have a choice. It's possible for us to make the wrong choice, but before we were saved, it wasn't possible for us to make the right one. We were just dead in our trespasses and sins. You know, we and verse 11 says, "Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord." We should reckon ourselves or consider ourselves we should think of ourselves as someone who is freed from sin. In other words, I should have this mindset that when it comes to sin, that I have the freedom to not do those sins. Many people today, they have this attitude, I can't help my sin. I can't stop my sin. You know, I, I have no control over this alcohol. I have no control over these drugs or, or whatever it is that's just keeping them down in their life. But we should consider ourselves as victorious. Jesus Christ paid for our sins on the cross. We have his spirit that's inside of us. Therefore, we don't have to sin. Now, physically, I'm completely capable of sin, and I often do, but I never have to. I never have to sin. Okay? There, I, I can't just sit there and say, oh, it's not my fault. I was born this way. No, when I sin, it's my fault. I shouldn't have done it, but I chose to do it. And you know what? When I do, when I choose to disobey God, God is going to deal with me as one of his children. And the Bible says, for whom the Lord, lo uh, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. God chastens those that he loves. I don't think I quoted that exactly right, but I think you get the gist of that. So let's keep reading. It says in verse uh, 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. We could, should consider ourselves living. And therefore, as someone who is living, I have the ability to Go forward and do the right thing. I don't have to sin. I've got some control. I can fight against the devil. I can fight against the sin. But it is. It's possible for us to go for me to go either way. I can sin. I can go without sinning. So when Paul said sin shall not have dominion over you, he was not saying that saved people would never be deep in sin. He was just saying it wouldn't have dominion. In other words, it's not stronger than you. See, if sin is reigning in your life, if your life is just one of constant sin, it's because you are allowing it. You are letting sin reign over you. And Christians who are living in sin, they live in sin by their own choice. They are letting it happen. The way I've illustrated it before in church is I'll have my, my young daughter you know, come up, and I, the way I, I illustrate it, I'll try to get off the platform, but I will let her stop me. I'm bigger than she is. I'm stronger than she is. And the truth is, you know, if my nine-year-old daughter is able to hold me back from something and stop me from doing something, it's because I'm allowing her to. It's because I'm using her as an excuse. If I want to get through her, I can. I'm bigger. I'm stronger. And the truth is, you if you're saved today, you have Jesus Christ inside of you. He is stronger than the sins of this world. He is stronger than the devil. And if you are just living in sin, it's because you have chosen it. You are allowing it. And you have no right to do that. And you have no excuse. There, there is no excuse. And there's a lot of people today that just have this attitude. I can't help it. It's just who I am. Well, you're either a liar or you're not saved. If you're saved, you have Jesus Christ in you. You don't have to do these things. So in verse 14, when it says, For sin shall not have dominion over you, 
for ye are not under the law, but under grace. So now we've seen the context going up to this. So when he's saying you're under grace, is this referring to a time period that we are now in the age of grace? Obviously not. That is just foolish. Is he now saying here that the law is no longer matters? You don't need to learn the law anymore. You don't need to even try doing what it says to do. Is that what he's been teaching? No, because he said, you know, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Therefore, if we are capable of continuing in sin, and the Bible's calling it sin, then that means it's bad. It means we shouldn't do it. Well, what is sin? Sin is a transgression of the law. What law? The law of the Old Testament. That's what that's talking about. And we shouldn't be going as believers and just throwing out the New Testament and forgetting about it. And then to go and say, we're not because we're not under the law, but under grace. That is just foolish right there. We have no right to take advantage of the grace of God. And you know what? Pastors today who refuse to preach the Old Testament to the people in their church, they are derelict in their duties. They are not doing what God said to do. They should be preaching against sin. They should be thundering from the pulpit the Ten Commandments. teaching, And they should be teaching people the importance of of morality and the importance of God's laws, this ought to be a regular thing, yet it's almost not even touched anymore. All everybody wants to talk about is he that hath no sins, let him cast the first stone. I mean, and think about that. Okay, everybody knows a story where the woman is taken in adultery and brought to Jesus, and Jesus made that statement, he that is out without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. And everybody has just decided that was Jesus Christ throwing out the law. Not taking into consideration what Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10 says, where it says you're supposed to bring the man and the woman, the adulterer and the adulteress. What did they do? They took a shortcut. They only brought the woman. Listen, every bit of the word of God is important. Every jot and tittle of the word is important. And these people, they did, they weren't even asking Jesus to follow the law just by stoning that woman. And the truth is, Jesus would have been violating the Roman law at that time because at that at, during that time, the Jews weren't allowed to put anyone to death. And yet people just throw all that stuff out and they use that to just throw out the moral law of the Old Testament. That doesn't make a lick of sense. If you think the moral that right there proves Jesus threw out the moral law, then you can can you please explain to me what sin is today? If right here in Romans chapter 6 he said, "How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein in sin?" Can you explain to me what that sin is? Can you explain to me what it is that he is saying God forbid to? What is it? that I'm not supposed to take advantage of? What is it that I am capable of doing that would upset God? You know, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son of me receiveth. Can you please tell me what the Lord would chasten me for? What is it that I am capable of doing that would cause the Lord to chasten me? Can you tell me what rule that is? Can you tell me what law that is? And the truth is, you are a hypocrite when you try to throw out that Old Testament law. And that's exactly what is happening today. Many pastors, they, they won't even touch the Old Testament with a 10-foot pole. They can't handle it. But folks, these laws in the Old Testament, they are tough. People get uncomfortable reading all the examples and all the things that brought the death penalty. It, it makes people squeamish. They don't like the thought of that. But folks, that's God showing us just how sinful these things are. And people are like, well, why can't we just talk about love? Well, here's the thing. If you're just, if we're all just these wonderful people that are just so great, then you know what? It's really no big deal that Jesus loved us. If we're all just so wonderful and deserving of heaven, that's not great that Jesus loved us. But here's why the love of Jesus 
is such a big deal. And it's because of the fact that we are so unlovable. Why are we so unlovable? Because we're filthy sinners in the eyes of God. But how is anybody supposed to know that if you're not going to tell them about your, their sins? There's going to be pastors all over this country today and all over the Sterling Rock Falls area. They're going to get up in church. They're going to talk about how Jesus loves them, but they're not going to explain why that's a big deal. You know why it's a big deal? Because sin is a big deal. But if they're not going to talk about sins, then people are just going to walk away thinking, wow, I'm really great. No wonder God loves me. We have to preach against sin. We find out what sin is from the Old Testament. And then what's supposed to happen is people are supposed to realize, I can't keep that law. I can't be good enough. I need a Savior. And, I, and then hopefully they will call on the Lord for salvation and he will save them. And now they are under grace. Now they are no longer under the law. Not meaning that the law, you know, that the moral law and the things of God aren't to be practiced anymore. God wants us to please him, but meaning I'm not condemned by those things anymore. Even though I often violate the laws of God, no one can tell me that I'm on my way to hell because of that, because I'm not under the law. I'm under grace. And where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. And it says in verse 15, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. God forbid what? That we would sin while under grace. What is that sin? Violating the law. Violating the Old Testament. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sins, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness." I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants, to uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants, to righteousness, unto holiness. So right there we, just, we see that we have that ability to yield now. Just like before we were servants to the flesh, now we can be servants to righteousness. For, ye, for when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness, what fruit had ye then in those things, whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Why? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right there we see sin, folks, is still a thing. The law is still a thing if you have not received the gift of salvation. If you've not received that, folks, you're under the law, and that law has you condemned, and you will die, and you will go to hell unless you accept the gift of salvation, the free gift purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. Trust in him, get saved, and then after you get saved, now you have the choice of whether or not you're going to yield your body or yield your members as servants to righteousness. I now have a choice. If I sin, it's my fault. I can do righteousness, and God wants us doing righteousness, and we know what sin is, we know what righteousness is, by the law, by the Old Testament. Preachers, start preaching the Old Testament again. Teach these people what sin is. Show them how bad it is. And maybe some of these people will realize, you know what? I can't save myself. I'm too bad of a sinner. And maybe they'll call on the Lord for salvation. So thank you so much for listening. We hope you will tune in next week, same time. God bless.